Everything is going to be videotaped today. That's what's going down. Because we are going to have an exam on Monday. What's that? That gets us out of a review, which I think is even better because we are way, way, way behind now. All right, like almost a week and a half behind. Um, so, so as to not drag you in here every single evening in April, I don't want to do that. So we're going to try to stay ahead of the curve. That means that we are going to do Bismarck today. If you recall the analogy when we were looking at roulette to craps, this guy would be the crap master. All right. So we're going to take a look at Bismarck, and then um, and that's German unification. And I'm going to show you where that is. Then I'm going to do Russia and the three R's, which would be what we were planning to do in class on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, and then the review was going to be everything else. But all of those things are going to be on YouTube at some point today. All right? And that will give us the rest of the week to just do some specific things uh, to get ready for the exam. But then the, the lecture stuff will be on you guys. <coughs> you can watch it uh, when we get done with it. Um, but it's been a while, hasn't it? Like 10 days or something like that. So let's take a look at it. Everybody go skiing. Do whatever they do. Updates. I need updates. Somebody said something about the alt chapters. Um, so let me just tell you right now where we need to be with that. The first one is that this is a continuation of what we were looking at when we were looking at Camilo Cavour and Italian unification. That's the last thing that we did. Of course, that's fresh in everybody's minds, yeah? No, probably not. But <laughs> chapter 23 of Vialt is called National Unification in Italy and Germany, and that's definitely where you're going to want to spend your time, um, at least on some of the details of what we're doing now. Well, we, what I'm going to do, the Russia and the 3R stuff, is there's a chapter of Vialt that is chapter 19 that covers the first half of the 19th century in Russia, and then chapter 25 covers the second half. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Ritchie is going to be in Orlando. Really? So I'll make sure that you get that information. Please. So you can head out there and spend some time with him. Uh, I'd probably deduce 10, 15 points. <laughs> but I guess it would be good done. need him so you can fight him? No. I don't have any animus towards Tom Ritchie. There can only be one year of teacher. <laughs> in Orlando. <laughs> it can be everywhere else. I don't really care. Alright, we're going to go to Google Drive. Our little friend. So we can 
It's open. Academic, please follow along if you plan on like listening today. Unit 7 notes. These are chapter 24 notes, even though they're chapter 23. Uh, and this is called Notes Real Politicians. Okay. So, when we last left off, we were looking at Napoleon. Does everybody remember that? So that's technically looking at France, 1848 to 1870, but the other half of that story will be presented <coughs> to you. Remember what I told you about this guy. Played the hell out of roulette. What is roulette? Domestic policy. Thank you. Somebody was paying attention. That's awesome. Ooh. Domestic policy. What well, was craps? Foreign, Foreign policy. policy. All right. And... All that money and all those winnings that he had in domestic policy, he should have just got away from the table, cashed out, went and had a nice steak dinner, or attended a show. Meaning, rest on your laurels, you're really good at this. France is in really good shape. But somewhere along the line, he got into the, I don't know, the history books and realized that his uncle was a conqueror and decided that in his own special way that he could be a conqueror and everything he did in foreign policy was like a blow up. So stacking chips and then crapping out one after the other after the other until eventually he's going to give away his empire. Right? And the person that is ultimately the dealer is going to be Otto von Bismarck and we'll look at him. Camilo Cavour comes along, remember, and the big thing here was that um, as a real politician, he did a couple of things. One, he started slow and piecemeal, built up Sardinia Piedmont into something uh, that was attractive. All right? It was different than the rest of the Italian city-states. He had turned it into a commercial, financially stable, kind of cosmopolitan place. And then he took a chance and brought Sardinia Piedmont into an alliance with France and Britain when they were fighting against Russia in the Crimean War. And that got him a seat at the table. And the real goal that he had was Italian unification. He did not think that he could pull that off without foreign assistance. That foreign assistance comes in the form of Napoleon, who was looking for a victory. Now, why did Napoleon diss him in 1859? Does anybody remember that? Okay, that's great. Good for you. The reason why he dissed him in 1859 is because Italy is Catholic. The Pope is Catholic. The Pope was fearful as hell of Italian unification because then that removes his political and jurisdictional control of the Papal States. All right? It takes away something that they believe belonged to the Church since the donation of Pepin, which I think goes back to like 762. All right? So he wasn't down for that. This is Pope Pius IX. He is the most reactionary conservative. Think Metternich, but Pope. All right? And there's your Pope Pius IX. And so when the polls come out, and French, French Catholics realize that the Pope is angry about an Italian uprising against the Austrians, and the fact that their very own leader is the one that is fomenting this anger from the Pope, the French Catholics want answers. And they realized that this was an unpopular move, and that's why Napoleon disses Camilo Cavour and signs a separate treaty with the Vene or with the Austrians, in which he says, "Give Cavour Lombardy, you guys keep Venetia, and everything will be good." And that Cavour was upset and also went a little bit embarrassed because here he is trying to galvanize this movement for Italian unification. He realized he gets dissed and the big losers are going to be the Italian people. So he resigns from his post, but just as he's about to resign from his post, remember, Italy just kind of goes nuts. All right? And there is grassroots uprisings all over the place. And there's a return from Giuseppe Garibaldi. Whose is that? Is that mine? Oh, terrific. Okay. So Garibaldi comes back. And then the last move that Cavour makes, because now Italy is, is on the way of being unified, all right, except that Garibaldi is marching towards Rome. 
And remember what I told you. If, if he marches towards Rome, he faces a potential onslaught because remember, the Pope is in Rome and that the French, uh, the French troops are now supporting the Pope. So there's a potential war between the Italians, freshly unified, and the French, and Cavour knows it and has got to talk Garibaldi down. So when we get Italian unification, we get Italian unification, but we get it minus Venice, because that would have involved a war and a treaty that was signed between uh, the Austrians and the French, and then Rome. Okay? But eventually those things are going to come. But Italy, for all practical purposes, gets its dream. It's unified in 1861. Sans Venice, sans Rome. Okay, now the master. Okay, we get to Germany. Germany doesn't exist. Okay, remember Germany was a confederation of 38 states. That was the decision that was made at the Congress of Vienna. Prussia is a big player in this German state confederation. The other big player, of course, was Austria. But there's been designs for a German unification throughout the 19th century. That's what the Birkenschaften was about. That's what the 1848 revolutions were about. That's what the Frankfurt Assembly was about. And remember, it fell in the same way that all of the 1848 revolutions did. When the Frankfurt Assembly met and put blueprints together for what German unification was supposed to look like, they were fighting over the boundaries. There was a group that they called Grossdeutschers. And the Grossdeutschers wanted to include all of the German-speaking people. And that would have brought Austria in, and it would have also brought in a couple of territories in Denmark called Schleswig and Holstein. These are a couple at the very, very top of the German Federation, but they were under control of the King of Denmark. All right? And so they were like, let's bring it all in, and that will bring all the Germans together in a big unified pie. And they said, well, then that risks a war with Denmark, and it certainly is going to risk a war with Austria, because Austria is not going to want to just kind of envelop themselves into some German state uh, unless they can control it. So the Kleindeutschers were like, well, let's just put the German states together that actually want to be here. And that might not be everybody. It might not be Schleswig and Holstein. It might not be Austria. It might not even be Bavaria and Saxony and some of the southern, predominantly Catholic German states. But let's at least consolidate what we think we can consolidate, which is predominantly Lutheran northern states. All right? So they didn't really get a settlement on it, but they ultimately decided on Kleindeutsch. Right? And then they handed this con constitution, and they handed this blueprint over to the Prussian king. This is in 1848. His name is Frederick William IV, because we know that all Prussian kings are named Frederick William or Frederick William. Right? Frederick William IV looks at the proposal and says, I mean, they literally said, here's a plan for unified Germany. We want you to be the king of it. And he's like, I refuse to accept a crown from the gutter. What does that mean? That means that this guy's a divine right monarch. He believed that God appoints kings, not people. So he kind of pisses on them. And they were so upset that they broke up. Uh, some of them, like, left the country. They went to, like, the United States and started, like, making beer. All right? The rest of them are just kind of sitting there like, this was our big plan, we had it, we handed it to them on a silver platter, and he peed on it. All right? And so there goes the 1848 revolution, there goes the plans for German unification, there goes the liberal constitution, they're right back at square one. Then, Frederick William IV is like, yeah, king of Germany. I don't need the people to make me the king of Germany, I'll just make myself the king of Germany and wants to go along with the blueprint of a German unification. But by then, remember that the Austrians are, have kind of gotten their urge back. They've defeated Hungarians. They defeated Italians. They're ready to fight now. Okay? And the Russians were also keeping an eye on this and recognized that this would be a major upset of balance of power in that region if there was a unified Germany. So they said, dude, if you do any of this, we're going to fight you. This is called the humiliation at Olmutz, all right? Where Frederick William IV wanted to unify Germany under him, but that the very threat of it 
brought Austria and Russia potentially into a fight with Germany. Now keep that in mind. So it ended up being nothing. All right? You still have Prussia, you still have the 38 states, you still have powerful Austria, you still have Russia, you still have Schleswig and Holstein, and all of these other things. Now how does this lead to Bismarck? Okay. Bismarck comes along later. But after Frederick William IV dies and is replaced by the next Prussian king, whose name is Wilhelm I, William I, remember, in keeping with the spirit of Frederick's, Williams, or Frederick Williams, we finally have a William. Okay, Not attached to any Frederick. William walks in and recognizes that humiliation of Olmutz and says, how freaking embarrassing for Prussia that we would be potentially bossed around by Austria or Russia or anybody in this region. We're Prussia, okay? meaning we're the Sparta of the North. People should not be dictating terms to us. They should not be bullying us. The only reason they were able to bully us is because our military has fallen into disrepair. So his plan is, we need exorbitant spending on our military, we need to build up our armed forces, we need to modernize them, we need to industrialize them. And so he goes to what is the, the Russian, um, I think it's called the Lantag. It's, a, it's a, like literally like a Prussian parliament, made up of mostly Junker nobility, and says, dude, we want military appropriations. Now what do you think the Prussian Junkers are going to say? Give us a straight up constitution and we'll do it. They're having the same battles in the middle of the 1800s that the French had in the middle of the 1700s that the British had in the middle of the 1600s. It is no taxation without representation. Okay, So right now the Lantag functionally is like the Parliament of Paris in the middle where they have some kind of judicial say on how taxes are appropriated. All right? And they're going to want political concessions if they're going to ratchet up the amount of spending on the military. Does everybody follow Demi? Yes. Is he back there? You guys good? Questions about this? Probably not. Okay? Pay attention. All right. So, the reason that Bismarck comes in is because he is a Junker. All right? And they feel like if they put him in a position, and ultimately that position is prime minister, that he, either through force of will, or because of his power or his speeches, will be able to convince the Prussian Lantag that this is a good thing to do. All right? He gave these old speeches and he said, you know, um, the, you know the, the issues of the day are not going to be solved by a speech making or writings or whatever the case, they're going to be decided by blood and iron. So he was like a doer. All right? He was also there at 1848. He knew how embarrassing that whole thing was. So he's the kind of guy that force of will might be able to convince them that military appropriations are coming. All right? So he looks at him and he does exactly what Rene de Maupo did to Louis XV and just says, tax him. And William's like, dude, if I tax them, you know, they're going to reject it. We potentially could face some kind of onslaught uh, by the Junker nobility. These are the concessions we make. And he's like, don't worry about it. I got you. Just go ahead and, and, and force the appropriations, build up the military. You let me take care of the rest. What is he going to give them? What is he going to give them? He's like, they're going to thank you for giving them the opportunity to appropriate the funds. He's going to give them unification. That's the one. That's the ism. It's the trump card. Okay? Which used to be a cool thing to say. All right? But it will solve all the other problems. He's like, they're not going to meddle about who got to vote for what. They're going to be so excited that they are now part of a unified Germany. That's, that's the great goal. So Bismarck begins to work on it. Now, how does he do it? He starts to look at who potentially stands in the way of giving them German unification. Who is the biggest state that threatens German unification? They are Prussia. <laughs> Austria. 
okay? Austria would be the most diametrically opposed because Austria as a German state stands to lose. Okay, here's Austria, here's Prussia, in the middle of this is German states. If this becomes this, then Austria is just this. All right? So it's definitely going to be a threat for them. Okay? He knows that. So his goal is to try to somehow figure out a way to maneuver a fight against Austria. All right? But he's got to do it in a way to make it look like Austria is provoking the Prussians. Because if he doesn't, then the rest of those Prussian states aren't going to unify with the rest of here. Or all those German states around Prussia aren't going to unify unless they feel threatened. So you've got to turn Austria into an offensive menace. So that they will feel like we're protected if we hang with Prussia. So ultimately that's what ends up happening. How does it happen? He starts a war with Austria by fighting in Denmark. It's like, what? No, that's how he did it. He, you remember those two states that we were talking about? They are German-speaking people. They're also Danish-speaking people, but they're kind of in between. And they're up in the very northern part of Germany. They are called Schleswig and Holstein. Okay? And so there's a whole bunch of propaganda that goes to start getting like these Schleswigian and Holsteinian Germans like agitated. That they're being controlled by a foreign power. Right? Because you gotta start there. You know, you gotta get the news cycles going. Alright, so now there's agitation, and then Bismarck could say to Austria, our poor German people are captured by these diabolical Danes. Because Denmark, I mean, when you think diabolical, you think Denmark, right? So then they've got to start this, this provocation or whatever. And eventually what ends up happening is Denmark like takes a military posture and says, if anybody tries to, to stir up any more of this agitation, we're jumping in. He always provokes the war, so it makes it as if he's exacting in self-defense. So now they're going to liberate these poor Germans in Schleswig and Holstein. And rather than him doing it himself, because he's right next to them, he invites Austria. He says, let's do it together. That'll make it seem like all the German people together are fighting on behalf of all of the German people. What is he doing? He's setting them up. It's almost like inviting somebody to a bank robbery, right? And then, like, taking their mask off just as the cameras come on. That's what he's going to do. So, immediately they fight against the Austrians. Immediately it's over. I'm sorry, against the, uh, the Denmark, or the Danes. And it's over. They occupy Schleswig and Holstein. And he says, here's what we'll do. We'll get together and we'll talk about what the occupation will look like. Because eventually we want these German states liberated, but we got to kind of get them, you know, transitioned into becoming German states. So he's like, well, Austria, you take Holstein, we'll take Schleswig, we'll do a joint occupation. This is called the Convention of Gastein. He's got them right where he wants them, right? Now all he's got to do is figure out some incident where he can blame Austria for the way that they're occupying Holstein. So he's going to pick a fight with them, but he's going to pick a fight so that Austria has to make the first move. But before he does that, the other thing that Bismarck does is he makes sure that Austria is completely isolated from everybody else in Europe. Okay? How is he going to be able to keep Italy out of the war? <coughs> he promises him Venice. Easy. Alright? It turns out that when Russia had an uprising, when there was a Polish uprising in 1830, that the Prussians supported the Russians in keeping the Poles down. So all Bismarck had to do with Russia is remind them that they've been allies before. It said, hey, we got this little fight we're picking with Austria. Are you guys cool? Remember how we like gave you like two-thirds of Poland? All right, we're good. Britain, you don't have to do anything with Britain. All you have to say is, hey, Britain, no colonies, no commerce, no navy. They're out. So who's the biggest threat that could potentially jump in to support the Austrians? The French. 
but Bismarck's already thinking about that one. So he has a meeting with Napoleon. He knows that Napoleon has got a taste for occupation. And he's looking around and he's like, hey, you know what, if you stay neutral on this, there might be something in it for you. I know you guys have always had your eyes on Belgium. And Napoleon's like, yeah, but we all signed a neutrality pact, right? He's like, yeah, we did, but, you know, hey, maybe I look the other way if you jump in there. And Napoleon's like, sweet. You know, we finally get Belgium. That's been like a three or four hundred year goal of ours. All right, to so control that portion of the Netherlands. There's some French speaking people there. They'll think I'm a freaking genius. Right? And Bismarck's like, yeah, yeah, they'll think you're a genius. Okay, so, so, so chill. All right, we're going to fight Austria, but you guys are going to sit tight. And Napoleon's like, yeah, yeah, I need a victory, dude. Thanks for letting me have this. All right? He's already setting up his war with France before he even gets into his war with Austria. See what's happening? And he's got Austria completely isolated. So all he has to do in picking this fight, all he has to do is figure out a way to provoke Austria. No problem. There's a whole bunch of propaganda that starts to, to, to appear in Austria's occupied Danish territory. That the troops have been acting poorly or that they've been uh, like squabbling with the whole Steinians. And then Bismarck starts to rattle out some war, like just some like newspaper clippings, if you will, to say, yeah, I don't know if Austria is really up to the task. Maybe we ought to get involved there uh, and settle, you know, Holstein down so that, you know, they're good. Okay? In other words, just like absolutely starting to wound Austria's pride. Like Austria can't control one tiny little Danish territory. And then the very threat that the Prussians might move their troops into Austria's like treaty-oriented occupation puts the Austrians in a, in a posture that says, if you do, we're squabbling. And Bismarck's like, oh, no, 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 certainly not. He pins the whole thing and knows that he's got to come up with some sort of act to get the Austrians in. The Prussians start to move a little bit into that territory. The Austrians return, and now there's a major fight over occupied Holstein. But he's going to use it as Austria's attacking Prussia. And then gets all the other northern German states to say, Hey, you guys remember Ferdinand of Styria? You guys remember the Thirty Years' War when all these Austrian Catholic asses were running around northern Germany, like raping and pillaging and burning? You guys remember that? And all those northern German states are like, Yeah, Bismarck, we remember that. Y'all going to protect us? Bismarck's like, They go to war. And Prussia mops the floor with them. Okay? Austria is completely isolated. It's a one-on-one -on -one war. It's called the Seven Weeks War because it lasts seven weeks. And at the end of it, okay, um, they have a major battle. It's called Koniggratz, uh, but it's really pretty much a, a, a almost, you know, kind of rinky-dink sort of fight. There's not a lot of major losses. It's Austria that is completely overwhelmed, and finally they say, all right, it's, it's yours. You win. Okay. There's a Treaty of Prague signed. Okay. Schleswig and Holstein are annexed by Prussia, along with Hanover, Hesse, Nassau, Frankfurt. Austria basically says we are staying out of German affairs. That was the concession that was made. All right. So pretty much Austria at that point is a second-rate power. Okay. At least in the German conversation, it went heavy. Okay, in front of Prussia, who is now unified literally all of the northern and central German states. Of those 38 states, they unified about 30 of them. Okay? It says the only ones that don't remain were four southern German states that had Catholic identities and wanted to maintain their independence. They were Bavaria, Württemberg, Baden, and Darmstadt. In other words, he's almost completed his goal. Meanwhile, the Prussian Landtag is high-fiving each other. They had an enormous amount of military expenditures that were coming right out of their pockets. Bismarck told Wilhelm that they would be applauding me uh, for the privilege of being able to appropriate that money.
because I gave them exactly what they wanted. Okay? Does everybody understand what's going on here? So he picked a fight with Austria, and then here's the beauty of Bismarck. As soon as he gets done fighting Austria, he then sends emissaries to Austria and says, let's be friends. Almost like lending a hand after you like knock somebody on the ground and says, oh, Austria, we have too much history together, yo. I remember the Holy Alliance, Habsburg, Hohenzollern, man, we go way back, German-speaking people, all right? Now we know that you've been completely isolated and we, we whipped you and you know we, we no longer allow you to have a voice in German affairs, but we still love you. And the Austrians are like, oh, well that's swell. Because yeah, they had other concerns. They had concerns on their other border, the Balkan side, the southern side. So they were like, it's probably good that we have an alliance with this North German Confederation, which is what they were calling themselves now. Okay, last fight. And this one's beautiful. Okay, it's called the Franco-Prussian War. He picks a fight with German or with uh, France, because right after the war is over, remember Napoleon has been promised all of this territory, right? And Bismarck's going to be like, okay, yeah. So Napoleon's like, so dude, uh, what? When am I going to get Belgium? And Bismarck immediately goes to the papers and says, what? You guys want Belgium? Belgium was declared neutral. You signed the neutrality pact. How could you dare violate a sovereign state like Belgium? And now Napoleon's like, <laughs> how could you do that to me? Embarrass me in front of all of my people. Embarrass me in front of all of these other states. Embarrass me in the newspapers. Bismarck's like, Yo, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I never would have made a promise of some other person's sovereign state to you. And Napoleon's going to be like, yes, you did. But, maybe, you know, I have nothing I can do to prove it. All right. So Bismarck's already got Napoleon agitated. All right. Now, here's how he finishes it. Spain, of all places, is going to be the impetus for starting the fight. And it, it is because, eventually, Queen Isabella II, the last of the Bourbon leaders in, Sp in, in Spain, uh, is out. Okay? They kicked her out. They hated her. All right? And they want to give the throne to this Leopold, who happens to have a last name of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen. Hohenzollern. Leopold. What does that mean? That means that the Hohenzollerns, who are the North German leadership, also has control of Spain. And France is sitting there between Hohenzollerns, Hohenzollerns. And they're like, nah, that ain't going to fly. So they sent ambassadors to meet with William I to get him to say, we'll back off of that. All right? And so they sent this guy, his name is Count Benedetti, to meet with William and basically say, Napoleon advises that it is a bad thing for you guys to support the, the Prince Leopold uh, succession in Spain. Do you comply? And William's looking at him like, dude, who the hell do you think you're talking to? And if Napoleon wants to talk to me, why doesn't he come talk to me? Why does he send some like Italian count dude uh, posing as a French ambassador? I'm kind of frankly offended. Get the hell out of here. Okay? And then he gets so angry about it that he ends up like typing up this letter about what occurred and sends it to Bismarck. And Bismarck's like, <laughs> oh, okay. Gets out his eraser, gets out his pen, and then changes the dispatch. It's called the Ems Dispatch. And like doctors it to make it look like there was massive insults that were being hurled back and forth between the Germans and the French. And back in the, I mean, people insult each other all the time. But back in the 19th century, if somebody insulted you, you usually challenged them to a duel. Right? Remember, he's at a political capital. Think about where Napoleon is. It's like I told you, his stack of chips has gone from this to this. He's got nothing to lose. All right? 
He was embarrassed by the Cobden Treaty. He was embarrassed by the Mexico Uprising. He was embarrassed by the fact that he was involved in a war against the Austrians in Italy. Now, he was embarrassed again because Bismarck made him look like he was trying to occupy Belgium, which he was. Then he's embarrassed again by this Spanish succession thing. And finally he said, you know, enough is enough. Germany wants to fight man, let's get it on. And, pr and Bismarck's like, thank you. He walks around and he's looking, he says, how can I isolate France? Okay. And it's easy. Okay. He looks at the Italians, he's like, you guys going to stay out of a war with France? Yes. All right, we'll give you Rome. Cool. Austria, remember, you already made nice with Austria. Russia, hey, Napoleon. Russia's like, gotcha. Britain, he's like, Napoleon. Britain's like, gotcha. One on one. German states versus France. France is the one that made the provocative act. Okay? So now, Bismarck can go to the southern German states, the Bavarias and the Württembergs and all the holdouts, and say, hey, guess what? Hey, remember these words? Napoleon declared war. Now the southern German states were like, God damn it, I knew it. And they joined the rest of the northern German confederation. How long is that war going to last? Not About a month. Germany invades France. Napoleon gets captured in a battle called the Sedan. He abdicates. Now France is back to like square nine, all right, because they don't have a government. And basically the city of Paris is fighting the German army. And the German army has surrounded Paris to the point that the French are literally like eating animals out of the zoo in order to survive. And then finally they, they give up, all right? Germany has its victory parade in Paris. Okay? That's what ends up happening. They call it the Treaty of Frankfurt. They meet in Versailles at the Hall of Mirrors. France has got to recognize Germany as a state. They have to recognize Wilhelm as the emperor of said Germany. France has to give up two territories. Anybody know what they are? Alsace and Lorraine. Okay? which they believed were French people, right? And they had to pay an indemnity, which was they had to pay the cost of the trouble of Germany having to invade France. And they're humiliated because the Germans are having their victory parade. Can you imagine the Philadelphia Eagles like going down the streets of Boston? That would have pissed some people off, wouldn't it? Right, that's what the Germans did. So the French remember all of this. They were embarrassed, they had to pay costs, they lost territory, uh, they were humiliated. They had to sign off like all of this crap in their house, the Hall of Mirrors. You think it's coincidental when World War I ends that they sign the treaty in the Hall of Mirrors? It's like, we want you to eat it. You know, like a big plate of cat poop. You are going to eat the cat poop. No! France ate a big, big can of cat poop. Right, and they we're not going to forget it. Bismarck accomplishes his goal. Here's the last thing that I'll say about Bismarck. Once he unifies Germany, what does he do next? He's on a roll. He's 3-0. Win, Denmark. Win, Austria. Win, France. Unified the whole damn country. Did it in 10 years. What's next on his plate? He's like, let it ride, baby, let it ride. No. He says, you know what? We're done. I unified Germany. The only thing I want now, we're really powerful. The only thing I want now is peace. I'm going to run around, and I'm going to try to sign alliances, and I'm going to try to keep as much peace as I can. It was so rare. That's what makes him brilliant, is that he knew that this is it. This is all we have to do. He recognized that the only state that was strong enough to deal with him was Britain. And he's like, Britain's got their thing. You know, the Navy and the colonies and all that. We're not going to play that game. Let them play that game. We're going to play right here. 
All right, we're a National League, he's American League. All right. Unfortunately, the person that succeeds William the First, who is William the Second, doesn't want to stay in the American League. Okay, and fires Bismarck. And when he fires Bismarck, World War One is on. Okay, um, Annabelle, can you stop time on that, please? God, I hope that I hope that's not on. There. Did you stop time? Um. I don't know what you just did. Did time stop? 